Hi, everyone. Um, so we just heard an awesome talk by Fred telling us um, that global clusters are excellent places, excellent locations to form binary black holes that later merge. I'm going to talk about a different, uh, a different star cluster, and I'm going specifically to show you how supermassive black holes in galactic nuclei can lead to the merger of black holes. Um, but first, let's set the stage. We know that almost every galaxy hosts a supermassive black hole in its center, and surrounding these uh, supermassive black holes um, are very dense uh, environment of stars and stellar remnant. So if I have a binary somewhere here, not only it will feel the gravitational pull from the supermassive black hole in the center, but also it will constantly, frequently interact with the neighboring stars and stellar members, uh, remnants, and we're going to take that into account. But maybe the first question that you want to ask is, why even talk about binaries? Uh, of course, if you ask this question, that means that you have not paid attention yesterday, uh, because stars love to live in a binary configuration. Um, and here I'm showing um, an, uh, the fraction of stars with companion as a function of spectral type. Our sun, roughly here, had a 50-50 chance to have a binary companion. And more massive stars, the stars that we care about, most of them, if not all of them, live in a binary configuration. Awesome. Now you can say, OK, fine, this happened in fields and clusters that we can go and observe. But what do we actually know about galactic nuclei? Maybe things there are so different, they are so dense. What do we know? Well, luckily for us, we have a galactic nuclea, nucleus just in our backyard. And very detailed observations on the galactic center allows us, allow us to go and understand what happens everywhere. This is under the assumption that we're not that special. I know it's kind of shocking, but what can we do? Um, so what have we learned from observing our own galactic center in, uh, in, high, um, in very high details? So first of all, we already observed three binaries in the galactic center. These are very complicated observations to do, and it's pretty awesome that we were able to observe that. Of course, I did not do any of the observations. I'm a theorist. Um, they don't let me be near a telescope because I'll break it. Um, but from these three binaries, and uh, we can have estimations of how many binaries you should expect in the galactic center, and you find that the fraction is comparable to young clusters, or even larger. There are also other evidence of lots of binaries in the galactic center. For example, the lots and lots and lots of X-ray binaries. It seems that it's even higher abundance than what you would expect of X-ray binaries in the galactic center. Um, in addition, there are hypervelocity stars. So hypervelocity stars, the idea of how they are formed is that when you have a binary going very, very close to, um, to the supermassive black hole and, in this, um, and it disrupts the, the binary, one member goes on a very tight configuration uh, orbit around the supermassive black hole and another one goes far, far away and a lot of people from, uh, from here worked on this. Um, and also, uh, the stellar disk, we have a stellar disk inside the galactic center. It has many puzzles that can be explained only if you just uh, ask to have some binaries in there. So we have many, many um, evidence that there are lots of binaries. In fact, Dr. Sue said it better than me. Uh, binaries are everywhere. Um, OK, so now we have a binary in galactic nuclei. What do we do? So here is our binary, and here is our supermassive black hole. Let's ignore the neighbors for just a second, because they're complicated stuff. Uh, we'll add them in a few slides. So in order for this system to be stable, um, these two binaries need to be in a tight configuration compared to their orbit around the supermassive black hole. This is hierarchical triple system that I'm describing. Um, and what happens is that on short time scales, orbital time scales, nothing interestingly is going on. The two binary members orbiting their tight orbit and the mutual center of mass of the two orbits, the supermassive black hole, and that's it. So what I can do is instead of looking at three body, I can 
um, average over the orbit. I can smash the mass around the orbit and treat this as two wires interacting with each other. It means that the energy of each orbit is conserved, and everything that I'm describing comes from angular momentum exchange between the two orbits. <coughs> this, um, this work was studied, this system was studied back in the 60s by Kozai and Lidov, for example, in planetary context. And um, what Kozai, for example, did, he took the three body Hamiltonian, expanded in semi major axis ratio, because the ratio of this to this. Uh, is a small parameter if, um, if the system is stable. And what he found, he found that gravitational perturbation from the third object basically um, trade inclination for eccentricity. So when it's less inclined, it's more eccentric, and when it's more inclined, it's less eccentric. And if you've ever heard anything about COSA in your life, you might have uh, heard th about this, that there is some conservation law um, that Kozai said that exists, which describes the angular momentum projected onto Z axis. The Z axis is the total angular momentum, and you can see here the oscillations, less inclined, more eccentric, more inclined, less eccentric. Now to make a very, 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 very long story short, what we have shown is that this conservation law is only correct in a very specific uh, configuration only if your outer orbit is circular, that means that I have an axis symmetric potential, and only if one of my inner members is a test particle. In this case, only then this is the conserved parameter. In any other case, like all the cases that we have in nature, um, this doesn't work. So what we have done is that we rederived the system, we allowed uh, for the entire um, the, the angular momenta to change, we went to the next level of approximation. This is a pertur uh, perturbation theory, and we didn't like the uh, low order. And um, basically what it meant is that we can tap to larger parts of the parameter space. We can flip the entire orbit, but more interestingly for us, uh, we can reach extreme eccentricities. So here is an example of just a binary in the galactic center, this is inclination, one minus e, because we care about the pericenter passage as a function of time. You can see here those oscillations, what I've mentioned as the flips, low than the, below 90 degrees and above 90 degrees, just to drive home this point, this is what happened if you use the 60s calculation, so there is a qualitative difference between the quadruple lowest order to the octuple, but what I want to draw your attention are these high eccentricity spikes. So what does it mean if I have these very high eccentricity spikes? Is that if I have um, just a binary in the galactic nuclei, the supermassive black hole induces gravitational perturbation, induces eccentricity that later can, um, uh, can make this binary merge quicker than it would if it would just stay there. Okay, that's all nice and fine, but uh, what about those pesky neighbors that I mentioned before? So let's think what happened if we just, for, for just the sake of uh, the physical process, just ignore for a second everything that I just told you and think about the neighbors. So what did the neighbors do? So no eccentric cosi lead of for a second. Um, this is a very dense environment, as I said. So we have frequent uh, interactions with neighbors. They keep on coming and say hi. And these uh, frequent interactions are being accumulated until basically we break up the binary. And when we break up the binary, that means that we're on the clock. If my supermassive black hole wants to induce merger in the, um, in the binary, it has to do so before the neighbors will come and break out the party. So we can just take that into account. And uh, we can consider some time scales. So here I'm plotting time as a function of how far I am, how far the binary is from the supermassive black hole. This is the typical lowest, uh, lowest level of uh, approximation quadruple time scale. This is the unbinding time scale that I've mentioned. I've also plotted here the first post-Newtonian precession of the inner orbit, because if this one is much, much shorter than the cosi lid of uh, precession, then I'm, I'm suppressing any eccentricity excitations. So I need that to take that into account. Um, in this, for this particular system that I'm showing, at 0 0.1 uh, parsec, 
the, uh, the precession and the quadruple time scale match, therefore I should not go beyond. In fact, we find for a larger part of the parameter space, 0 0.1 parsec is like the magic number, that beyond that, the efficiency of merging things together is not that good, so we're just constraining ourselves to there. So this is what uh, my students set up to do. So this was led by Bao Ming Hong that sits here, but I don't know where she is. Where are you, Bao Ming? She did, oh, she's over there and she has a poster and I highly recommend that you'll go and see it. Um, and Bao Ming said the following, you know what, let's go and look at soft binaries. And I want to understand what a supermassive black hole does to this uh, soft binary. So here we have the big guy, and it's smashing the supermassive black hole binaries. No Avenger fans in the audience, I see. OK. Um, and then oh, I'm the only nerd. Um, so she included eccentric cosi leadoff mechanism. She included first post Newtonian for the inner and outer orbit, um, gravitational wave, of course. Uh, unbinding processes that can basically break up the, um, the binary. Also a possibility to break up the binary when we come too close to the supermassive black hole. And Newtonian precession. Newtonian precession takes place when my inner orbit holds some mass in it and causes the entire outer orbit to process. So she took that into account. It didn't make any difference. We can actually ignore it. Um, here is an example of one of her systems that she uh, simulates. This is inclination, 1 minus e again. Semi-major axis is a function of time. Um, you care about the red line here. This is a system that would not have merged uh, if the supermassive black hole didn't do its, uh, its great job. But what we actually want to do is, of course, um, do some Monte Carlo simulation to simulate a bunch of systems. Uh, but then we have some unknown. What we don't know is how these binaries are being distributed around the supermassive black hole. So we simply tried a um, few, um, we tried a couple of, uh, of distributions. One we said, okay, maybe it's a bacall wolf distribution. And another one, when we look at our own galactic center, there are some, uh, some population inside of disk, and then it seems like the disk fanned out. So if I'm deprojecting the disk, this is what I will get. So we tried them both. We applied stability after we, after we put those binaries like raisins on the cake. And this is how it looks, the distribution after we apply stability. They are really different. What I'm going to show you, that it really does not matter. They provide the exact same, um, the exact same result, which is very good because it means that the results are very robust. Uh, we want to um, play a little bit with the merger rate. I share uh, Fred's view that uh, we should take merger rates with uh, some extremely big rock of salt. Um, but the, the reason why we want to play with it is just to see if we're really in a ballpark that is interesting. If we're getting zero, then it's not interesting. So how do we actually calculate the merger rate here? So we have the total merger rate, which is equal to the number density of galaxies, which we assume that times the fraction of galaxies that hold supermassive black hole. We are very conservative, we assume half. If you are a believer that all uh, galaxies have supermassive black holes inside of them, just multiple everything that I show you by a factor of two. And then times the rate in each galaxy. This rate in each galaxy is equal to the number of binaries times the fraction that merge times the frequency, the rate of mergers from our simulations. So we can take these two from our simulations, and as I'll show you, they're really insensitive to how you distribute, uh, to actually the distribution that you choose. So these are fairly robust. And that means that we have only one parameter that controls our rate. This is the number of binaries. We don't know the number of binaries. How many binaries we have? I, I, I don't know. If, you're, if you have a good guess, that is good. So if I don't know something, I want to know how my results depend on it. So for example, this is the total rate after multiplying everything as a function of the number of binaries. And this is steady state over 10 to the 8 years. And the reason that this is 10 to the 8 years is because most of the time, most of our uh, binaries, their soft binaries, remember, they uh, unbind. The neighbors come to break up the party after 10 to the 8 years. So if you have a scenario in your mind, where you have some star formation 
and just wait, nothing happens for 10 to the 8 years, I always need to replenish over 10 to the 8 years time. And then you get this rate. However, you can tell me, Smadar, you know what, I do know the number of binaries in galactic nuclei. I think that in galactic nuclei you have some sort of continuous star formation, and if I have continuous star formation and I do some population synthesis, then I can get the actual number of binaries that resides there. So if we believe this, we can get a large fraction of a larger fraction of uh, of binaries with, that results in a larger range. So we have this range of black hole merger rate. And just because it's fun, we can just uh, have this tally of, uh, of all the dynamical channels. Um, so here is what happened inside 0.1 parsec. We can also add uh, the work that uh, Ryan O'Leary and Benson and Avi did of uh, two binaries, the two black holes that come very, very close and get stuck together and merge. Um, this gives us um, this merger rate. Then we can also say, you know what, maybe if I'll go beyond 0.1 parsec and I don't have spherically symmetric, this is a spherically symmetric distribution of stars, this is actually a derivative of COSI. I'm getting an octuple perturbation for free and that also creates a perturbation that can have some interesting rate, so I can add this as well. Um, and now I can add also uh, Fred and Carl's global air clusters to the business and um, I can end up with something that sounds interesting or not. It has a very large range, of course. Um, there are also other interesting um, uh, dynamical processes like a binary that gets stuck in an accretion disk of an AGN. So we can think about interesting stuff. But one of the questions that, um, that came up yesterday and today as well, how do we disentangle? So there is something interesting about the way that uh, binaries are merging with the, with the help of supermassive black hole. They are more likely to merge closer to the supermassive black hole um, than those that just stand there. The, the neighbors didn't come to break up the party and they just stood there and merged. And that means something because if I'm here, here is Earth, I can, um, when this thing is coming away from me, going around the supermassive black hole, it's red shifted, and when it's coming toward me, it's blue shifted, and I get this phase difference in the waveform. And that may be an interesting possibility to disentangle binary mergers in galactic nuclei than everything else. I want to emphasize, um, uh, when I'm, I'm getting now to the end, but I want to emphasize one thing here. There are not a lot of there are actually no significant knobs to change. There, this is just physics. If you have binaries in galactic nuclei, supermassive black hole, this is what it will do. There's no getting around it, basically. So that is the punchline. And again, the big guy, I asked him to do this. Again, no Avenger fan, so fine. But what I showed is that supermassive black holes um, are very efficient in merging black holes, black holes together. Um, it's insensitive to the way that I'm, uh, the, the way that I can put the binaries around the supermassive black hole for all I care. We, you can just put them as raisins uh, in a cake. We don't know. It doesn't matter. Uh, the rate is interesting. That means that it's comparable to other dynamical channels. And there is a possibility to disentangle between different scenarios. And that's it. I don't know if I was okay with time. Saved all the time that Fred took. Thank you so much. Smadar, <laughs> um, I didn't catch one thing. What did you assume about the separation distribution? Um, not from the IMBH, but within the binary. Sorry, not from the SMBH, but within the binary. Excellent question. Um, of course, because I have a, a slide. But um, we said, for, we thought to ourselves the following. We said, you know, what about if we're just uh, having star formation? And since star formation are born in binaries, we can use, for example, Sana et al. distribution. Um, and then you apply stability, and this is what you get over there. So for different stabilities, you get different, um, different possibilities 
uh, that will stay together, um, and that's it. So let's say that either your scenarios uh, of star formation takes place or Selma's scenario of star formation takes place, but, um, but the main point is that I don't need to wait for giga years for it to, uh, to merge. It will not survive a giga year in the galactic nuclei. But eccentric quasi Lidov just really helps in this point. So this is a comment to both uh, you and Fred. So as you know, I'm a big advocate also of the dynamical channel. Uh, and I agree with both of you that uh, the rate estimates are, of course, very uncertain. But I think it should be emphasized that there's a very robust upper limit, which you get if you assume that all black holes merge once in a globular cluster or of the order once, so let's say not more than three times or whatever. whatever. Uh, in both globular clusters and galactic nuclei, you can easily, easily count the maximum rate. So let's assume that we know how many globular clusters there are in the universe and, or how many galactic nuclei there are. And we know we can assume or uh, calculate how many black holes we should expect there. If all of them merge once per 10 giga years, you get a rate of 30 events per gigaparsec u per year. And so this is of the order of the numbers that these complicated uh, simulations give. But in the end, if the rates, the LIGO rates will be more constrained, and it turns out to be, let's say, 100 or 200 uh, events per gigaparsec u per year, then these channels will be in trouble, of course, to explain all of the rates, right? I don't think that we try to explain everything. Sure. There's no... Fred had a comment on this, and then he... Uh, I think you can easily boost it by another order of magnitude. Again, all global clusters are very well defined as a class of star clusters, so we can get that number for them. And yes, we can push it by saying all the black holes in all the, glo the old global clusters in the universe have merged. But remember, there are lots of clusters that are not all global clusters. And if you do the exercise the following way, you just look at the star formation history of the universe, and you say some fraction of it goes into star clusters with a, a certain initial cluster mass function. All the clusters that are above a certain mass are going to do the sort of dynamics that, that I've described. And you know, most of them are not going to survive. I mean, they're the super star clusters that form that redshift 3 or 2 or 1. You know, they're not here in the local universe seen as surviving all global clusters. It's been known for a long time that probably most of the things that could have been halo global clusters in the Milky Way have long disrupted. Uh, they might still have been around long enough to produce dynamically lots of LIGO sources. So there's a, there's a big extrapolation there that certainly goes up, I would guess, by an order of magnitude if you were willing to be optimistic. So, so 200 is still not a problem. <clears throat> Just a quick question about that uh, red shifting signature. You must have been referring to LISA measurements, right? Because the time scale for the orbits is so long, and LIGO can't detect a redshift. It can only detect a change in redshift. Yeah. I mean, well, any gravitational wave detector. So um, what I'm plotting here are three examples of uh, of Thaumin's uh, uh, binaries. Do not scoop me. Uh, <laughs> um, here I'm showing the, um, the string. This is the pericenter frequency. Um, and maybe here it's also helpful to see the pericenter frequency as a function of time. So this is time evolution of three and it's in Lisa band. It's very confusing because they go back and forth into Lisa band. This time goes by. You can see it here, for example. The octopole makes life very difficult to Lisa. Um, but it goes back and forth. And uh, you can see it for here for 10 to the 5, 10 to the 5 years, for example. Uh, here for, again, 10 to the 5 years, you can see it for a, a long time. Um, it, of course, raises a complication that we need to have a waveform for eccentric binary, uh, very accurate to be able to, distinct, to um, disentangle that from everything else in LISA. And that will tell us, once we get this, um, after X amount of time, we get this very accurately, you will see something in LIGO. Some of it will be after 10 years, and some of it will be after 10 to the 5 years. 
something in life where we need to, to live with this forever with Lisa. Yes. My question has to do with um, galaxies is different than our own. Uh, we tend to think that our galaxy is typical, but in fact, if you look um, at the history of the universe, most, most galaxies started small, and the building blocks of the present-day galaxies used to be dwarf galaxies uh, of the type of the satellites that we see around the Milky Way. And so, um, in your calculation, um, uh, which fraction of the mergers are contributed by these small galaxies, if you go throughout the cosmic history, wouldn't you expect the small ones to behave similarly to the global ones, producing many more? So the two mechanisms can act in concert, but it's quite possible that you have many more sources than just the global ones and the present day big galaxies. I completely agree. I think that, so we were extremely conservative in our calculations. We assumed the present day distribution, and we assumed that only half has this uh, a uh, supermassive black hole in them, but if you go back in time and you allow for everything, then you get a... That wasn't me. Um, you get a much larger fraction. I com I'm completely with you here. Uh, we were trying to be extremely conservative, so, you know, no one will say, oh, you're being too... Uh, to mix this with your <laughs> estimations, but I was really trying to be conservative. But yes, uh, Vicky, I expected a question from you, and you didn't ask it. I can ask questions privately. So let's thank Smadak.